Hello, my name is Adriana Frescas. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm going to present to you today about how calcium is the boss of everything. I'm currently at Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science. Um, here is my email. Please feel free to reach out to me with permission of your parents or their help uh, if you have any questions. A little bit about me. I'm originally from Colorado and I was very interested in science growing up. I was raised by um, two engineers and they enjoyed getting me little microscopes and uh, tinker toys and just trying to get me interested in science. And eventually during high school, I was able to join a program through Children's Hospital Colorado. And through that program, I was exposed to medicine. And I found out that I enjoyed working with people and that I wanted to have a real personal connection with them. And while I was encouraged to do science my entire life, one of the other things my parents really emphasized was helping people. One of the things you can do as a doctor is really help people out when they're sick. So I went to Colorado State University with the intention of applying to medical school afterwards because I wanted to be a doctor. And I got my bachelor's of science in biomedical sciences. I, during that time, I was in a lab because one of the things I heard was that medical schools really like it if you do research. And that was one of the reasons I was doing research at the time, but I found that I really enjoyed it. And one of the things I did during my undergrad experience is I went back to Children's Hospital Colorado and I got involved with a clinical research program. And one of the things I found is that you could actually combine these two careers. You could be both a scientist and a physician. And that for me was really cool. So sort of last minute, I had decided to change my entire application from just applying to MD schools to applying to combined MD PhD programs. And I got a fair amount of interviews for MD PhD. But ultimately I didn't get into a single MD PhD program but I did get into medical school. I got into Chicago Medical School, which is affiliated with Rosalind Franklin University. And through some help from my mentors and a lot of questions and answers, I eventually got the opportunity to apply to transfer into their MD PhD program. And through this is what I'm currently doing. I'm at the tail end of my PhD. I'm going to defend in about a month. And that's really exciting for me. But we should probably get back to calcium. So where do we get calcium from? This is, of course, uh, something that's rather fundamental to our understanding of what's going on in the body, right? So one thing we do know is that we get calcium from our diet. So you might know this, this is milk. Uh, we can also get it from other products like cheese and cream cheese um, but, and other vitamins. And so what happens is you drink the milk, right? It goes into your mouth, goes into your stomach, goes into your intestines, and it's absorbed there using vitamin D, right? And it's absorbed into the blood. So from the blood, where does the calcium go? Well, the obvious answer that most people would say is it gets stored into the bones. And this is what makes your bones strong, right? That's why everyone's told to drink their milk so they get plenty of calcium. Well, one of the things that your bones also do is they release calcium into the blood. And this is maintained by part of a system in the body called hormones. And it's very important that calcium stays at a certain level in the blood for normal, physio er, normal function. So what does it do in the body? Well, first answer you might say is, well, it makes our bones strong, right? The bones are mineralized by, with calcium, and you're correct. 
another thing you might not say at this moment, but you will after we finish, is that it helps with muscle contraction. What does that mean? So if you get up and you walk around, your muscles are contracting. It's allowing you to move. So if you want to run around, you're using calcium. Well, what else? Maybe you're just sitting there and you're saying, well, maybe I'm not using calcium. Well, you are. You're thinking, right? And in your brain, there's nerves that are firing, right? And in order for those nerves to fire, you have to have calcium. And there's a lot more functions for calcium, right? Now, I don't have time to go into all of them. It's simply because then I would never stop talking. And I, as much as I would enjoy that, we have to move on. Um, so... Where does calcium do its work? Well, like many things in the body, where it actually does its work is inside of cells. So this is a generic cell. You might notice that it has a little wrapper on the outside called the plasma membrane. And then on the inside, it has several different things. These are called organelles. One of the organelles is called the endoplasmic reticulum. And I'm going to mention that because this is going to be important in a moment. So things we need to know. On the outside of the cell, calcium concentration is high. However, in this cytosol, this goo, the inside of the cell, calcium concentration is low. Well, where does all the calcium? It's stored in the endoplasmic reticulum right here. However, in order for calcium to do its job inside of the cell, calcium has to increase inside of the cytosol. You might be asking, how does that happen? Well, there's little proteins on the plasma membrane, and these things are called channels. And what they essentially do is they act like little doors. And some of the time, doors are closed and calcium can't enter the cell. However, other times, cal calcium can enter the uh, cell because these channels or doors open up. And that's how calcium can do its job. Let's talk about some places where calcium can do its job. Let's talk about the heart. In the heart, you have cells called cardiomyocytes. Cardio means heart, myo means muscle, and site means cell. So all the altogether heart muscle cell. It, what calcium does inside of the cardiomyocyte is it causes it to contract or shorten. And what does that mean? Well, it allows the heart to pump. So moving all the blood around the body is requires the heart to pump. So what might that look like, you're asking? I can't see calcium. Well, We've developed little tools. This is from my lab. My PI gave me permission to show you this. We have several cardiomyocytes here. We have these two, which are healthy cells, and this is actually a sick cell. So let's pay attention between the differences here. And as you might know, the heart beats at a constant rate. So you can see them contracting fairly constantly. Whereas this one, you might have saw it briefly at the beginning. It's not really doing much of anything. So now we're going to put a little bit of adrenaline. And adrenaline essentially occurs when you are in that fight or flight mode. As you can see, they start lighting up and contracting a lot faster. And why is this important? Because if you're in a situation where you have to get away, say there's a lion in the room and you need to run away, you want your heart rate to increase because you want blood to get to the body quicker, right? And that's essentially what we're seeing here. As you can see, it's all uniform. So all the doors or the channels inside of the cell, they're opening at the same time, and that's why it's flashing together. As you can tell, this isn't very coordinated. So this wouldn't be a great thing inside of your heart because you want the heart to contract all at once in a coordinated manner. Well, where else might calcium be important? Let's talk about blood vessels. You know, those arteries and those veins, the things that carry blood to the rest of the body. 
Well, they're made up of a different type of muscle called smooth muscle. And just like in the cardiomyocytes, when calcium enters the cell, it causes it to contract. Well, what might that look like? And why is that important? Well, this causes the artery to narrow, which means the flow is limited. So how do we want to think about this? Well, let's say your entire class is walking down the hallway. If it's a big hallway, it's easy to walk together, right? However, what happens when the hallway gets smaller? It, it say it goes from um, 10 feet to like three feet. It makes it much harder for you guys to walk down that hallway. You might have to walk slower or in a single file. That's the same way arteries work. So a large artery can allow a lot of flow, but a narrow artery limits the amount of flow through. So how might this be different? This is the same thing. The same dye, so calcium entering the cell causes it to light up, right? Just like we saw before. And what I'm going to start this video now. What you can see is it's not like those cardiomyocytes, right? You can see the individual smooth muscle cells, but you can also see these little flashes here, right? And these are what we call sparks because scientists are silly. And essentially what it is, is only certain channels or doors right there are opening up at any single time. And instead of like contracting back and forth, because that wouldn't be very good, we want to keep the diameter or the size of this artery constant. So that means that we need to maintain calcium relatively at the same amount. And that's sort of what we're getting here. And you can do this by uh, several mechanisms, but mostly just wanted to show you that unlike cardiomyocytes, the calcium here is occurring at little hot spots rather than uniformly across the cell, meaning that the way calcium works in different cells is not the same, and it's all dependent on their function. So for these cells, it's important for calcium to be constant, where it is and maintain the lumen or the diameter of these arteries at the same. Whereas in the heart, you want it a very rapid contraction, right? So the basis of my project in the lab is actually looking at very different cells. So, so far we've been talking about the cardiovascular system, but let's talk a little bit about the immune system. And what the immune system essentially is, is a surveillance system inside of your body. And we have these cells called macrophages. Macro means big and phage means eater. So essentially big eaters. And what are these? These are immune cells that defend the body against bacteria and clean up dead cells. And essentially how it does that is by going to sites where there might be bacteria or there might be dead cells and eating whatever's there. So these are some macrophages. I have it for this experiment. As you can tell, they're kind of round and they've got these interesting, uh, what are called lamellopodia. Over here, I have a pipette. And what it's going to do is it releases a little chemical into this area here. And I'll start playing it. What you'll see is they'll all rush towards it. And what I've done so far in the lab is I've shown through putting on drugs that calcium is important for this whole process. Let's play that again, since that was rather quick. So you can see, like, the cells do a very good job of finding where that pipette is. They're sensing that danger. So one thing we know so far is that calcium is important for cell migration. Sorry, let me bring that back up. What are some challenges working with macrophages? So before we are putting dye inside of these cells and look, watching the dye light up when calcium entered the cells, 
However, if you put a uh, dye inside of the macrophages, they actually eat it. And this is really frustrating for me. There's ways to overcome this. But one of the other problems is that not only do they eat it, but when you heat them up to, say, body temperature, they actually leak all, all the dye. So how do we overcome this? Well, we can. there's things inside of your cells called proteins, right? You've heard of this. And unlike dye, protein is trapped inside of the cell. So essentially what we need to do is we need to get a protein that acts like the dye, right? And it will light up when calcium is high. So here are a couple macrophages. I realize it's kind of faint. They're essentially in the center of the cell. And off to the right here, I have a little pipette just like before, and it's got ATP in it. ATP is a chemical that's normally found inside your cell. So say you get a cut, all your cells around that cut are going to be releasing ATP because they've been broken open. So what do you think is going to happen to these cells in terms of what's going on with calcium? Do you think they're going to light up? Do you think they're going to get less bright, more bright? Let's make a prediction. And that prediction will essentially be your hypothesis. All right, let's play the video. Well, what did you see? As you saw, um, when we released the ATP, the cells light up. So calcium got high inside of the cells, right? Isn't that cool? Well, now we've done that little experiment. I hope you have a greater appreciation for how calcium might help your body coordinate things and understand what's going on outside of it and inside of it in terms of like uh, everything. Um, sorry. So I want to thank you again for watching this mini lesson by a medical scientist. Feel free to contact me.